We go to the theatre. We witness stories. So I think it's important not to separate out. And you know, people say to me, oh, we don't do drama at our clinic, we do enactment. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we don't say it's drama, we just say it's social skills. And there still is this stigma in many places around the actual word drama. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that we acknowledge that and find ways to overcome it, ways to explore it, ways to define it so that we feel confident. Mm -hmm. I sometimes say that I think drama therapists are rather like Ringo Starr <laughs> of the Beatles. Do you remember when he was interviewed, Ringo would say, I'm only the drummer. <laughs> That's always his response, I am only the drummer. <laughs> and I've heard drama therapists say, but no, no, don't ask me, I'm only the drama therapist. <laughs> and I think we need to address that in our training, in supervision, and in our writing of actually elevating the status of the drama therapist. Mm -hmm. I think the drama therapist, by and large, is very like a latter-day shaman, but working in a contemporary context, mm -hmm. who will use ritual, role play, storytelling, movement, dance, projective work of all kinds in order to activate the drama process. And what concerns me as well is that many people see drama as a sort of rag bag of techniques. You know, somebody will say, oh, come and do a bit of your drama. You, you, you know, there's clever techniques you can use on Friday afternoons. <coughs> Completely ignoring that drama therapy is a process. It's a therapeutic process that touches individuals and groups as well as the therapists themselves. Now, during pregnancy, mothers are usually <coughs> interacting with their unborn child. They will talk to their unborn child, and they will answer themselves as if they were the child. The people that talk about as if and Stanislavski forget that it actually is starting in utero. Mm -hmm. That's why the whole idea of as if and role reversal, mothers taking on the role of the baby and talking to themselves. <coughs> in the research I did, I found that many mothers were very reluctant to admit they did this because they thought it was a laughing matter. Mm -hmm. And when I explained how important it was, they really opened up and had long discussions and said the longer the pregnancy, particularly after the baby began to move, the more they had these interactions, they told stories, they told the unborn baby secrets that they weren't to name anybody else. And then if you think about it, once the baby is born, that process continues. Mothers and babies talk to each other in all sorts of ways, little sounds, little squeaks, little yelps of joy, and the formation of the beginning of the words. Now what I think is important is for us to acknowledge and again to be able to research and develop the fact that within three or four hours of being born, the baby tries to imitate the expression on the mother's face. And it's not wind, and it's not pickups, it is actually the act of imitation. And now there's a lot of material on this now, it's been well researched. So if you think about it, at birth, if within a few hours we start to imitate, imitation is the first act of drama, mm -hmm. actually imitating A a number. Mm -hmm. And of course if mothers pick up on this, you get all sorts of conversations between mother and unborn baby, and sorry, born baby, newborn as well as echoes and so on. And I think that stage laying the foundation of dramatic interaction at birth is extremely important. And I think before the baby is born, there is the first circle of attachment. I think the important thing about attachment is the containment, the borders, as well as the mutual 
relationship. And that starts to take place not at the end of the first or second year, as some clinicians will say, but that actually is becoming established during birth. Sensible doctors and nurses and midwives put the baby straight on the mother's chest <coughs> so that that continues rather than whisking the baby off and washing it and weighing it and all those silly things people do that are really not important. The actual contact on the chest of the mother is the most important. Also, that is also how we start to understand rhythmic playing and how essential it is in those early days and months. And if mothers put newborn babies or young babies on their left shoulder, very often the baby will change its own heartbeat to the heartbeat of the mother. So you get like a synchronized heartbeat, which again shows how much of a biological disposition we have that reinforces dramatic interaction. We've already now got imitation, and we've got rhythm. The second circle of attachment is the baby actually being contained in mother's arms. Whether it's here, or whether it's like in the two pictures here, that containment. And I think with many of the issues we have with children and teenagers, certainly in Western Europe today, there has, doesn't seem to have been a notion of borders and containment, that children will break borders without being aware of it. They will step outside their circle of attachment. And perhaps that's something, again, drama therapists, because we use circles a lot. In rituals, we use circle a lot. We use circle dancing, we use drumming circles, and so on. Maybe that's an area with small children that we could specialize in and help to create the circle of attachment. What I think is very interesting in that first picture is that mutual gaze between very small baby and mother. But this third circle of attachment is when mothers begin to be aware at a psychological level of the baby. And those of you in the audience who are mums, I'm sure, will remember how very often you will wake up in the night five minutes before the baby wakes up. We're so fine-tuned to the mood of the baby waking and sleeping that we actually become synchronized with that. And I think the other thing to mention in this context as well is how breast milk itself helps to create the 24-hour rhythm for the baby. And there's beginning to be a lot more research on this now. But just as milk will be more solid in the morning and if it's a very hot day it will become more watery as an adaptation for a thirsty baby who doesn't need a thick milk at that point. The morning milk has the type of hormones to stimulate energy and wakefulness and the evening milk has more melatonin in it which will helps to encourage drowsiness and sleepiness and so on. So even our milk has within it the capacity to regulate the child's wakefulness and sleep, which I think is where biology, neuroscience and drama all come together. Okay, this is my attempt to bring together the important elements that I see making up the dramatic interaction. And the first concept is neurodramatic play. And that includes what's in the center. Sensory, messy, rhythmic, and dramatic play. <coughs> All of those things starting within the first couple of months of life. And neurodramatic play continues to develop during the first year. Now, the reason I got into NDP, or neurodramatic play, 
was I felt my original hypothesis about embodiment projection role was very neglectful on the embodiment side. And it was far more to embodiment during early life than I was giving credit to. So, neurodramatic play, if you look at the outer circle, in child development, leads into embodiment projection role, and then leads into what I call theatre of resilience. And I think that is the developmental paradigm when we start using drama with newborns or we're working with children or teenagers with attachment difficulties, behavioural struggles of various sorts, suffering developmental delay, all those things that we know about, that actually is a developmental sequence that we can follow. And as you see in the middle circle, NDP is mainly about attachment. Embodiment projection role, mainly about empathy, leading into the theatre of resilience, which is to do with actually us being able to cope. Resilience is all about managing our lives. And for many children and many grown ups, that is a struggle. An example of when I was working in a psychiatric unit just, just a few years ago, and we had this wonderful actor psychiatrist who believed in all the arts in his clinic and he would find money to pay for art therapy, drama therapy, music therapy and play therapy, all the arts. And it was an experimental program of people who were self-harming or suffering from eating disorders but they had to come in, to come in Monday to Friday for nine months. I thought it was a very interesting gestation period. Mm -hmm. Visualise it out. And we had our own staff group, we had external supervision, so that we were all communicating well together. And there were some remarkable changes in this intensive program. And there were certain people taken off suicide watch, certain people that had stopped self-harming. And what was important was the integration of all the art therapists, and them all be given equal value. And I think one unfortunate thing that happens in, in uh, Western Europe is that the arts therapists often get competitive with each other. Mm. Whereas far, far more would be achieved if, like at this hospital, we all work together on an integrated programme for clients and patients who very often the very thing they need is something to integrate these various parts of themselves that don't work all together. Mm. So that's just reiterating what I have just said. I won't dwell with it, but this is what neurodramatic play is about. I separate out messy play from sensory play deliberately. Because I want to emphasize how important mess making is. And how we are so preoccupied with wet wipes and tissues and runny noses and you know, I mean, what's wrong with your sleeve, really? <laughs> and to actually convince families and nurseries that the messy play is the good bit is actually quite hard. Mm -hmm. And one often has to show what happens when you allow children to do messy play because always, almost without exception, messy play leads into form. <laughs> You need the mess first, and out of mess comes form. Mm -hmm. It's what I call the transition from chaos to order. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, is one view of how the world was created in the first place. That there was an awful lot of chaos before we had some sort of form of life and so on. Mm -hmm. I will add just one little word of warning here for those of you working with clients and patients that for some children, or teenagers, or even adults, whose life in itself is a mess, messy play can actually be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And we need to be very vigilant, and if that is the situation, then I do what I call construction play. So, 
like, I don't know whether the actor who did the play I saw on the first day using all the garbage, and then they built the wonderful tree. I don't know if you're in here in the audience. That was a lovely example of being able to play constructively without having too much mess. Hmm? Have a box of Lego, big Lego, so nobody fails because they can't undo the bits. It's always setting people up to succeed, not to fail. Mm -hmm. And big Lego or other sorts of construction are another way of creating order. Mm -hmm. Can I please ask a question? I'm sorry? Can I please ask a question? Um, could we have questions at the end? Do you mind? Yes. Is that all right? Oh. And Warren, will you tell me when I need to stop the question, please? Because I don't have a watch on me. Sure. So dramatic play forms the basis of attachment. And attachment forms the basis of the story of our lives. Mm. And we soon know when somebody has not had a satisfactory attachment early in life, they've been abandoned, or rejected or neglected, that's very often where we as a play, drama or art service need to intervene <coughs> to recreate some kind of healthy attachment. And at this point I would say it isn't just about therapy, it's also about the arts. And those of you that know Bessel van der Kolk's book, about neuroscience and the arts. And if you don't know it, please read it. It's a fantastic endorsement for the arts as well as the arts therapy. And I think we need to acknowledge any actors in the audience here, I mean you, that actors, when they perform for us, are taking these risks on our behalf. They're doing the dangerous bit while we connect or process or whatever we might be doing. But I think actors need special, <coughs> special, special affirmation for the danger they will enter into for us. Yes. So trauma of any kind usually interrupts the attachment relationship and can cause anxiety, depression, and other types of disturbance. But it's often not acknowledged that the child who we say is acting out or has behavior troubles is actually trying to find a way to tell you that they have been traumatized. We tend to be much more sympathetic to the very depressed child, the, the unresponsive child, our caring instincts are drawn more to them than those who will smash the place up, throw things, hit us, fight, and so on. And I think if we look at the information that's now available about trauma, in particular what happened in the Romanian orphanages when Ceausescu, the dictator, made sure that Children in the orphanages were not well treated, were not well funded. Many of them were starved for days at a time. I mean, children would be fed every three days because mm -hmm. other people stole the food, for example. Now, in terms of the neuroscientists, these are two typical Romanian children who were in an orphanage. What they discovered was not just issues around behavior and attachment, what they discovered were issues around the brain. And there were parts of the brain that hadn't developed in these children who were neglected and had no attachment. Yeah. And some of you will remember, especially the oldest like me, that once upon a time people would argue, is it nurture or is it nature? Is it nurture? Are you born with it or is it the way you're looked after? Now, generally it's accepted that nature and nurture are versions of the same thing. But the lack of nurture can cause severe brain damage, 
and that often that can't be repaired. So we're not just talking about attachment being at the basis for developing healthy relationships, we're also talking about how it influences how our brains grow. And the more recent thing they've discovered too is the fact that we have mirror neurons. And these mirror neurons, which are present very early, will reflect back to the infant what is going on around them. So the child born into a family where there is domestic violence will have violent images reflected back into their inner brain. A child that's born into a nurturing, loving, warm family will have those images reflected back. So the discovery of mirror neurons means that instead of thinking, set a good example, and the child will follow, you, you set a positive example because the child's mirror neurons at weeks old will reflect those back. Because, I don't know about you, but I've come across sometimes families and I come across psychologists themselves who say, oh don't worry, he's too young. He's too young to notice. Mm -hmm. Or he's too young to be affected. <laughs> what nonsense, you know? When a secondary attachment figure of granny has passed away very suddenly, oh, don't be worried about the children. And that's the very time we should be worrying about the children loss of attachment. Mm. One of my favourite sayings I created was, we feel calm in arms. Mm. That's how we are just held, and that whatever else might go on for us, we are held. We know our body borders, mm. and we feel that warmth. And often, if we're working with <coughs> children who've actually lost control, of their body borders, how but just the act of holding or wrapping them in a blanket and holding will be that calming, calming influence. Because we know if the child is sent to their room or told to sit on a naughty step, which those ridiculous TV nannies told a generation of mothers to do, if you isolate a child who is so distressed, all it does is to flood the brain with cortisol. And we know that too much cortisol is actually very dangerous. So the child, whatever the behaviour, whether it's in Tesco's at home or at Granite's, whatever, we need to find a way to hold. And following the holding will come the calming. Yeah? Okay. Now some of you know that I did my doctoral research in the jungle in Malaysia. I took my three children to live with a tribe and we lived with them for a year and a half. And primarily, I was looking at a peaceful tribe in the world. They don't hit their children, they don't shout at them, they are very much child-centered, like this conference is hoping to be. And then go to Malaysia if you can, meet these people. They are child-centered. Mm -hmm. And they have aggressors and invaders like large logging companies that try and steal their land, etc. But the family unit is considered the most important part of their lives. And what's very interesting, they have this notion that everybody has a head soul, and your head soul just rests on top of your head. But also the village has a head soul. So they do their trancing and dancing and singing, to keep the head soul of the village strong. And that's, I think, a wonderful, both a reality, but also a metaphor of bringing everyone together to share a creative experience. And babies, after just a few weeks old, you know, are carried in a sarong sling because mums are beating out the rhythm with bamboo stompers, and there's a chorus singing, and people are dancing, people then go into trance, or if it's a healing seance, it's structured slightly differently. But what I want to include here, because I still find it phenomenal, is one of the greatest fears for the tribe is tiger 
And to them, Tiger is all powerful and all destructive of all men. The tiger knows what you're up to. You know, like a little tiger policeman up in the sky, sort of thing. And the greatest shaman, the highest shaman of all, is the one who, when they have set up the seance, can actually turn into tiger. And it was actually very interesting because even tribes, people who've been out of the jungle, gone to school for a while, come back, mixed with people in towns, although they dismissed a lot of other beliefs, said it was absolutely true that the tiger shaman actually turned into the tiger. And what I think is very interesting in that notion is the thing that is the most dangerous of all, a human being is capable of turning into as a way of control. Yeah? I mean, there's not time to tell you about the tiger seance in detail, that in itself is fascinating, but I find particularly the as a way of coping with so much destruction and invasion. It's a way of empowering themselves to become <coughs> this very, very aggressive, dangerous animal. So I put about fear, because so often for them it's managing fear of the unknown. This is with the invaders, the loggers, the people coming and stealing from them. And there's a lot of corruption, which we all know about. This is in my house, so I could just see the fire in the background. And this four-year-old was playing at mother's. And you can see how young that baby is. And she's got complete responsibility for looking after this baby, which she does beautifully. But it does get warm there, and babies are bathed in warm water to cool them down a bit. So she was playing at being a mother with a real baby. And there's her on the left, and then five, she's four, one on the right is five. And if you look closely, they've each got a one-year-old on their backs. Do you think what strength that is for a four- and five-year-old to actually carry a one-year-old in a sling on their back? And they've borrowed the parasols from their mothers, and again, they're playing mothers and babies at a very young age. Now, this is one of my favourite pictures. Because this is the child who is not quite four. And he was a seance the previous night. And this is the corner of our house, like a sort of little platform in front of it. And they had the seance at our house because we put a bigger living space than, than many of them. And he went round and found the leftover decorations and the whisk and the, and the headdress. And he was all on his own singing away a shamanic song to himself and using the whisk as a shaman uses it. And I just thought this was such a delightful thing. He didn't need the other children around to do it. He could do it for himself. The idea of the use of story, particularly if they can be stories that are interactive, that people can join in or contribute, and so on. I think our experience is to help children learn empathy and to become resilient. And I think therapeutic storytelling can also help children who have suffered trauma. I mean, now in all my sessions, whether it's therapy or whether it's teaching, I always end with a bedtime story. To remind people, whoever they are, of that importance. Stories that have some kind of resolution, particularly for children and teenagers who suffer trauma. And some of you have seen my new book, uh, The Story of Lewis and Mouse, which is written quite deliberately with certain therapeutic themes without it being like a moral code to impose on children. It's about two animals, very different, who actually discover friendship together. And I tried it out in various schools, you know, and sort of, Moose, Moose was very big, how big, when these three and four year olds wanted to be Moose, I wanted to do his big footsteps around the room, but there was little mouse and he was all squeaky. Even at that age, the youngest child in the group was three, several three year olds through to five year olds, 
wanted to be participants in this story. And so on the basis of this, that's a sideline, a side issue, sorry, I should say, I'm um, slowly letting go of drama therapy and play therapy, and I'm going to, I am becoming a children's author. I think <laughs> that's going to be very satisfying for my last few years. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> the story has in it friendship, empathy, and attachment. And if you look closely, you'll see how the mouse has got some ivy and twisted it across Moose's antlers. So you have like a little harness <coughs> in the story, she's frightened of falling in the water. So this is the second story about Moose and Mouse, about actually managing fear. And again, starting very young. And this is a challenge for any linguists in the room. We need to challenge your idea is that Society is based primarily on language. Where people who play, homo ludens, and people who dramatize, homo dramatica. <laughs> <laughs> that is who we are. And we do that from birth. And I'm going to ask you all just to relax for a moment and close your eyes. I'm going to just tell you a very short bedtime story. It's a story from the Yoruba, I have to give it its context, and it's called Little Monkey and Papa God. Near the forest lived an old woman, and she loved honey. And she'd go out every day into the forest and collect honey, and the bees were very nice to her, they allowed her to take honey because she never took too much. Soon her house was full of jars and pans and bowls, all filled with honey. And the woman couldn't keep up with it. She gave some to her family and friends, but still she had too much honey. So she decided that she would go across the forest to the market and see if she could sell some of her honey. She put on her best Sunday dress and a pot of honey on her head and set off the market. Unfortunately, she tripped over a big tree root and fell flat on her face and the jar of honey broke into lots of pieces. She picked herself up and dusted herself down and went back to her house and she shook her fist at the sky and said, Papa God, why do you send me so much trouble? And she got a little bit further and she shook her fist again. Papa God, you are sending me to trouble. All this while, little monkey had been at the top of the tree, looking at what was going on. When the woman had gone, he cautiously came down the tree trunk and went to look at the big, big puddle of honey. He was very thoughtful, and he put a little finger in and tasted it. Mmm, he said. Oh, that's lovely. Mm, I like trouble. <laughs> so he put another finger in and tasted it again, and then a whole hand and licked it clean of honey and then, oh, honey is just wonderful. Trouble, trouble, trouble for me. I want more of it, he said. When he finished up all the spilled honey, he said to himself, well, I'm going to go and talk to Papa God and see if he will give me some more trouble. <laughs> Off he went up the mountain where Papa God lived. Papa God was working in the garden and said, Hello, little monkey, what are you doing here? I've come to ask you for some trouble, he said. <laughs> really, said Papa God, are you sure? Oh, yes, said little monkey, I love trouble. <laughs> right, said Papa God, after a moment. You go back down the mountain and start across the desert and you will soon find some trouble. Oh, thank you, Papa God, said the monkey. 
and skipped and hopped and sang to himself as he went down the mountain. He thought he was going to have a wonderful journey as he crossed the empty desert. But he suddenly became aware of something behind him. And he looked over his shoulder and to his horror there were seven wolves. And the wolves were chasing him with their tongues hanging out and very sharp teeth muttering and slavering and saying, we're going to get you little monkey, we're going to have you for our dinner. Poor little monkey was absolutely terrified and started going faster and faster and faster. And his little heart was beating in his chest and thought it would burst. The monkeys were getting closer and closer and they were still slavering, dribbling and muttering to themselves. And then suddenly, in front of him, was a huge tree and he shot up that tree right to the very, very top. And the wolves were very, very angry and they circled the tree going round and round and round, still muttering. And as we know, wolves can't climb trees, so there's nothing they could do about it. Eventually, it became twilight as the sun was going down and the wolves went back, one behind the other, over the distant horizon. And when they'd all gone, little monkey came down the tree, looked around, and scampered back to his own tree at home as fast as he possibly could. A very puzzled little monkey. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>